Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Shackman. It seems like every day the news gets grimmer. Polarization is increasing, constitutional norms are being overthrown, the social fabric is tearing, and as Yates said, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. In fact, as bad as it appears on cable news each night, it's nothing compared to what was happening in the 60s and 70s. Cities were burning, violence was loose upon the land, Nixon was drinking himself to sleep each night, and new villains had to be created to take the heat off Watergate and Vietnam. For Nixon, one of those villains became Timothy Leary. The way in which the story of Leary is the enemy that Nixon created to embody all that he thought was wrong with the country is a little bit wag the dog, all the president's men, and the Keystone cops. It's a story told by my guest Stephen Davis, the co-author of the new book, The Most Dangerous Man in America. Stephen Davis is an award-winning author of four previous books, including Dallas 1963, He is the president of the Texas Institute of Letters and curator at the Whitliffe Collection at Texas State University in San Marcos. It is my pleasure to welcome Stephen Davis here to talk about the most dangerous man in America, Timothy Leary, Richard Nixon, and the hunt for the fugitive king of LSD. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Jeff. It's good to be with you this morning. Great to have you here. It's interesting that at one point there, there was lots written about, you know, people thought Daniel Ellsberg was the most dangerous man in America. It's interesting that, that Timothy Leary now has that moniker. Yeah, you know, and it's funny because Nixon had an enemies list, you know, a mile long. And, of course, Ellsberg was at the top of it right. in many ways for you know, hastening the release of the Pentagon Papers. And... um Nixon, you know, he he had that view where um, basically as days went by, he would find new people to demonize. But really what happened is that for Bill Minutaglio and I, we really wanted to tell the story of Tim Leary's breakout from prison. You know, he had been running against Ronald Reagan for governor of California, and he had been caught with uh, two charred roaches in his ashtray of his family station wagon and then was sent to – uh, California men's colony, uh, uh, a 10 year sentence. And Leary was just about to turn 50 at the time. And he managed to break out of prison and, and went on the land for quite a while. And when Bill and I wanted to tell this story, we didn't really realize when we got into it, that Leary would uh, become sort of the public enemy number one for the Nixon administration. We have seen these references in the past to, you know, Nixon calling Tim Leary the most dangerous man in America, which I'm guessing he probably called a few other people at various times. Right. We had no idea until we got into researching the book just how incredibly personally obsessed Nixon became with Leary's recapture. And I love what you said about the Keystone Cops because there's certainly the, that farcical element as this chase played out across you know several continents and all over the world. One of the things that's so fun about this story and kind of remarkable about the story is that, that they set out to create Leary as this enemy, and, and, and really Nixon saw the perfect foil, the perfect enemy that he could create, but it was a creation. They knew it was a creation, but as time went on, they got caught up in their own hype about it. Yeah, and you know, and part of that's because they didn't really understand the nature of this mind revolution that Tim Leary was leading. You know, they were terrified of what LSD could do. And, um, you know, the person who was really advising Richard Nixon, a couple of people advising Nixon on drug policy, one was G. Gordon Liddy, who had led those earliest raids on Leary's compound in New York uh, at at Millbrook, and uh, had been hired to work for the Nixon administration as an anti-drug warrior. And the other was... uh, Art Linkletter, the old radio and TV host, who was, you know, sort of a favorite uncle for a lot of people in America at that time. You know, he had that little show, Kids Do the Darndest Things, and he was just seen as this real sweet down-home guy. Um, You know, Linkletter's daughter uh, had tragically committed suicide, and Linkletter blamed that on LSD and blamed it on Tim Leary personally. He said, you know, when somebody like Tim Leary talks about the benefits of LSD, we need to jump on him with hobnailed boots. And we have this scene in our book, and you know, this comes from Nixon's secret White House recordings as well as Linkletter's own recollections. But 
Linklater is invited to the White House with Nixon, and he basically, quote unquote, educates the president on you know what marijuana does to people and what it's like, and it's just this really surreal scene because Linklater doesn't know anything about drugs, and you know one of the things, one of the great lines that my co-author Bill Nutaglia wrote in this book is that you know these people saw. Tim Leary is a rope spear on acid, and they saw him sort of unraveling the social order. And so for Nixon and the people around him, they really didn't see any difference between somebody like Timothy Leary and Charles Manson. They saw them both as just these destabilizing forces um, consumed by LSD, these messianic visions. And of course, you know, Leary, who had originally been busted for for two joints, um, as you alluded to, by by the end of this chase, um, there were hundreds of years of felony charges stacked up against him. He was seen as this huge uh, drug kingpin. There was a $5 million bail placed um, upon him, which was the highest civilian bail ever at that time. And then, of course, when he finally was recaptured, he ended up, guess what, next to Charles Manson in Folsom Prison. One of the things that's so interesting, you touched on, on the destabilizing perception that they had of Leary, was how crazy things were in the country at the time. You know, we think that they're kind of crazy now, but they were a lot worse then in many respects. Yeah, you're exactly right about that, Jeff. And you did a nice job alluding to that in your brief intro and giving a sense of it. And, you know, at the time that Tim Leary was being sent to prison. Um, he was traveling up the California coast and on his way to San Luis Obispo for the California men's colony. And that was just a few days after Kent State had happened. And of course, the reaction to Kent State was uh, just massive protests in the streets. You know, universities were shut down. Reagan had shut down the college campuses in California. And it was a time of uh, great unrest. And of course, um, in state that original protest was in reaction to Nixon expanding the scope of the Vietnam War. You know, he'd been elected with that secret plan, as he called it, to end the war, which, of course, he ended up not having. And so there was all kinds of unrest. You know, the, the draft was, was going on. Um, and there was a group out there that some of your listeners may recall, uh, the Weather Underground. And they were originally known as the Weatherman Underground. And their leaders, um, Bernadine Dorn and, and Bill Ayers, um, just a couple of months before Tim Leary had escaped, uh, members of that group had been uh, crafting a bomb in a Greenwich Village townhome. And that bomb had actually exploded and killed, I believe, two or three of their members at that time. And so the Weather Underground, uh, along with many other groups, were planning bombs and, and protests are really aimed at property for the most part. Um, but, you know, you have bombs going off regularly in government buildings, and there are a, a few pages here and there we give just sort of a, a brief update on, on the tenor of the day, and nearly every day in America at that time, you know, there, there were bombs going off in bank buildings or um, research labs, uh, government offices. It was just crazy. It was just, you know, the times were unraveling. And people, a lot of people really believed that America had become a fascist oligarchy that needed to be overthrown. And there was a, a real sense that a revolution was possible and maybe even likely at this time. And these are the very people, this leading edge of the, of the young revolutionary movement, um, the, the exact people who uh, Tim Leary ended up connecting with. And, and Tim, of course, had been a, you know, a pacifist and really not a very political person, but he got involved with the Weather Underground and also with the, the Black Panther Party. In many ways, by chasing Leary the way they did, the, the Nixon administration made him much more of a folk hero than he ever was. I mean, as you say, he was kind of non-political early on, but in the course of this, in this course of this story, in this chase that ensues essentially throughout the world, he touches on almost every counterculture figure of the day. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You know, he, um, Tim had, you know, he had that remarkable ability to, to always find the center of the action wherever he was, and vice versa. I mean, he he was the center of the action, and. Um, 
yeah, you know, he, he was there with the radical revolutionaries who helped break him out of prison. And then he's uh, flying over to Algeria with Eldridge Cleaver and the Black Panthers, where the Panthers actually had their own embassy in Algeria in those years, because the Algerian government, you know, did not recognize Richard Nixon's administration as a legitimate representatives of the American people. Instead, they recognized the Black Panther Party as the legitimate representatives of the American people. So the Panthers had a very opulent embassy. And from Algeria, Tim ended up uh, in Europe, in Switzerland. And so, you know, he's basically next door to Mick Jagger and Keith Richards when they're making the Stones, they're making Exile on Main Street. Um, he's going to parties where Andy Warhol is dancing with Tim's girlfriend at the time. And, you know, he's uh, meanwhile getting, you know, assistance from John Lennon. You know, Lennon and Yoko would send him these letters and they would contain, you know, $5,000 checks and things like that just to help Tim continue to survive. Because when he was on the land, um, you know, it, it was an adventure, it, but it was also kind of a comic misadventure. But there were really uh, a lot of undertones of danger, and and, um, and it was really difficult for him because he was not able to, to make a living at all during those years, and he was really being pursued not just by Nixon and, and his people, I mean, all over the world. The things that Nixon was doing to go after Tim Leary just, I mean, they just befuddled and amazed people in the State Department and, and other governments around the world, just the intensity with which Nixon was desperate to get his hands back on Leary. Um, so it was a very difficult time for Tim, even as he was bumping up against all of these people um, wherever he went. One of the things, and you touched on this a little bit before, is that Nixon made him a kind of larger-than-life character, that there's all this talk on the tapes about how Nixon got caught up in this whole story of who he was and you know, and made him this kind of Pablo Escobar kind of character. Yes, and this, this was really, I think, the moment that, that made our book. Um, you know, Nixon, his White House tapes, uh, many of them now are digitized and they're available for people to listen to. And we were able to find this tape that showed uh, Nixon in the cabinet room, which is, you know, uh, basically his um, various cabinet members and close aides. And Nixon was the only one in that room who knew that the conversation was being taped. And it was, you know, typical Nixon. He's sitting in a leather chair that's positioned uh, intentionally taller than every other chair in the room. And um, and at that time, this was uh, summer of 1971, and, and Larry had been out. Uh, he he just escaped in September 1970, so he'd been out for several months. J. Edgar Hoover had assured the president and the nation, you know, we'll have him in 10 days. And, of course, that didn't happen. And meanwhile, at this time, you know, the, the economy is not doing well. We're getting the first hits from the oil crisis, the energy crisis. Um, the war in Vietnam is just unspooling with no end in sight. And Nixon's poll numbers were dropping, and the polls showed that uh, Democrats such as uh, Senator from Maine, Edmund Muskie, were actually running neck and neck with the president. And Nixon was really concerned um, about his re-election prospects in 1972. And so in this conversation, you know, he's musing aloud to his cabinet about, you know, what can I do to to build my poll numbers. People say that I'm not tough in fighting crime and things like this. And that's when um, his Treasury Secretary, John Connolly, speaks up in that kind of Texas drawl and says, you know, well, you need to go out there and find yourself an enemy, Mr. President. And um, man, as, as you alluded to with the, the drug kingpin stuff, you know, they started thinking, you know, we need to find somebody who is like uh, Carlo Cambino or Lucky Luciano Al Capone, you know, because Nixon was at war against the counterculture. So the intention was to find a figurehead, a leader in the counterculture, and then completely demonize that person. And during this meeting, we heard them hit on Tim Leary as the person they wanted to demonize. And they all began shouting. It was kind of like cheerleaders chanting, Leary, Leary, Leary. And then Nixon said, well, we've got room in the prisons for him. While he was on the run, what sense did Leary have 
of the way in which he was being demonized by Nixon? Well, um, you know, Jim's escape is such a fascinating story, and, and it was so much fun to go into all of these archives and be able to piece together what happened. You know, his papers were saved by a couple of wonderful hippie archivists, Michael Horowitz and Bob Parker, and those papers now have ended up at the New York Public Library. And the Black Panthers have papers at various places. Um, Eldridge Cleavers are at UC Berkeley. Huey Newtons are at Stanford. Um, and of course, there are you know, FBI and CIA and State Department documents. And that's all what kind of helped us put this story together along with Tim's own recollections in, in various places. And, um, you know, when he fled from the United States, he, well, I'll say that when he met with Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers on a California mountaintop to, after he broke out of prison and was on the run, and I'll say the Weather Underground was very clever in how they carried out the escape. When Tim broke out of this prison, they immediately took his prison clothes and took them to a gas station just a few miles south of San Luis Obispo and dumped the clothes in a gas station trash can there. And when the cops found those clothes or the gas station attendant found them and reported them to the cops, they all seemed he was headed south towards Mexico. But of course, he was really heading north towards Seattle. But when he was meeting with the Weather Underground to figure out where he was going to go next, Tim was imagining he might end up in Hawaii or the Caribbean or perhaps Costa Rica. And of course, they sent him to Algeria. And one point I want to make is that, you know, Tim was fleeing from Reagan and from Nixon and this American law and order system that really made him a political prisoner for having the two joints. Um, but when he was on the run, you know, he it he was also used by the people who were the revolutionary activists for their own purposes. So, mm -hmm. so he became effectively a prisoner on both sides. Um, it was the marriage of dope and dynamite was the idea. And he thought he was breaking out to freedom, but he was being broken out because the idea was to politicize his sort of blissful, stoned followers and radicalize them into joining this kind of fringe revolution, revolutionary movement. So the big problems Tim had once he was in Algeria was that he had to hew to this uh, very hardline revolutionary uh, movement that you know looked to North Korea. Uh, as sort of the, the vanguard of the revolution. Uh, the Black Panthers uh, had basically fealty to the North Korean uh, leadership at that time and got support from them, along with the Algerians. And so you had this very blissful, peace-loving, formerly peace-loving guy having to go, you know, meet with the PLO and endorse the airplane hijackings and things like that. And so for Tim, his... His big interest really became in escaping from the Panthers when he was in Algeria. It was a very difficult situation for him. And it was only when he got to Switzerland and um, felt that he was relatively, uh, he might get political asylum there, is when Nixon people, and this coincides with Nixon's White House conversation we talked about a few minutes ago. That's when Nixon people really began turning the screws on him and began. Uh, pressuring the Swiss to surrender Tim Leary, and it just got worse and worse from there. You know, when they threw all those charges at him and, and uh, set up a $5 million bond. You know, a lot of people thought that bond was a reward. So Tim was being pursued all over from many different directions. How did it change Leary? How did he change? Did he become more radicalized as a result of this? Well, you know, he certainly... Uh, talked that talk when he needed to. I think he was a great shapeshifter. You know, he, he was something like Galileo uh, when the church, you know, forced Galileo to renounce what he had discovered through science. And he had to renounce that in order to keep himself alive, to continue his pursuit of discoveries. And I think Tim was very much in the same position. You know, even when he was in Algeria, Eldridge Cleaver wanted him to renounce LSD and psychedelic drugs. And um, it was, you know, I think for, for Tim, who was not without ego, he loved being the center of attention and he was good at it. And he was so charming. 
and he had that genius IQ and that ability to like explore the outer layers of human consciousness and then help us understand kind of what was going on there. You know, he had so much going for him. And at the same time, he became this villain who was subjected to such a pursuit. And he was not built or inclined to think in paranoid terms about people out to get him. Um, he was rather blissful in that regard. And that was one of the criticisms that Eldridge Cleaver and other people had was that, that Tim was not focused enough on security. You know, when Tim was in Algeria, he would go meet with young people and talk with them, visit with them. And Cleaver would say, how do you know these aren't CIA plants? <laughs> you know, um, but by the end, by the end of this, when he got arrested finally, and was brought back to America and taken in chains to uh, his trial, uh, surrounded by a huge blank of security. And then, as I mentioned earlier, found himself in a cell where his neighbor was Charles Manson and then uh, just really abused during his years in the prison system. I mean, that would have broken a lot of people. And I think that hurting him was broken by that. I never met Tim, but my co-author, Bill Minutaglio, got to meet him and continued to visit with him over the years. And Bill said that, you know, one of the things that came up in the very first conversation was Tim wanting to make sense of what the hell had happened to him and why he wanted to be able to put together the story himself of, of why he had become demonized in such a way and what forces really at work to recapture him. And, and to imprison him. And so, in a way, that's really what we wanted to do as part of telling this story. Did he ever fully understand it? Um, you know, the, the great thing about him, I, I think of Tim as sort of that folkloric kind of trickster character in Indian, Native American, uh, Southwest. There's this uh, figure, the coyote trickster, and the coyote trickster is this amazing creature who has this ability to well the coyote trickster for example would go into heaven and steal fire from the gods and bring it down to earth to, to share it with the people and so the coyote trickster could do these amazing things but at the same time uh, was a ridiculous figure uh, vain and um, foolish in certain ways and the coyote would be as likely to set his own tail on fire as he would be to bring fire from the heavens and Tim in a certain re but the thing about the, the coyote trickster too is that um, ultimately they survive and they may lose bits of their dignity at time or some pieces of fur but they survive to go on and continue to make mischief and to make the world a more interesting and more fascinating place and I think Tim really had that spirit where um, when he got out of prison it was very difficult for him for a time but before long, you know, he was back on the lecture circuit and he was doing his stand-up philosopher series and he moved to L.A. and became involved with the film community there. And then, of course, did his uh, roving debates with G. Gordon Liddy, right. one of his chief nemesis that we talked about in the book, and kept exploring the frontiers of consciousness. So um, somehow he was able to, to put it all past him and just keep moving forward with his life. What did we learn about the FBI and, you know, the kind of Keystone Cops way, as we touched on before, that they went after Leary? What did it tell us about the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover? Well, one thing we certainly learned is that the young people in the weather underground were a whole lot smarter than the FBI was at that time in terms of what they were able to uh, plan and carry out. You know, when Hoover told Nixon and, and the press, you know, we'll have him in 10 days, you know, that may have been the case back when he had sent a bunch of G-men after Bonnie and Clyde or whatever. But the Weather Underground, they were incredibly, uh, they didn't have a lot of money or resources, but they were very smart in every operation that they carried out and um, very expert to planning. And so the government had no idea where, where Tim was for the longest time. Um, and even even once they did, you know, the, the FBI 
Well, for example, I'll give you one example of what the, how the FBI was thinking about things. Um, because you know how they would work. They would go basically force people to inform, um, you know, by threatening them with jail or roughing them up or threatening to expose them or other, you know, holding people out windows by their ankles or whatever. I mean, yeah, it was just, it was a rough, rough time and rough tools were used. Um, but that doesn't mean that they got good information ever from any of that stuff. They were really not able to penetrate the weather underground. I think they had one operative in the inside for a while who I believe in their haste to make a bust, uh, unwitting or maybe even intentionally exposed that person, which were in the, the one source they had. But the example I want to give is that when Jim Leary uh, managed to escape from Algeria, finally, um, <laughs> the, uh, and, and this is also the CIA, but the Americans were pretty certain that he was going to land um, in Amsterdam for an academic conference on psychedelics. And so they had, you know, all these cops and they alerted the press. They had all these photographers there. Everybody's waiting for this fugitive, Tim Leary, to step off the plane so the Americans can arrest him in a grand show. And, um, you know, all these people are coming off the plane at the terminal and the cops are inspecting every person that comes off and searching a few and finally, you know, the plane's empty, and all they see are these two suitcases, one belonging to Tim, one to his wife. And that was it. <laughs> they had no idea where he was. And their informants were telling them things like, oh, you know, I think he went to Brazil. That's where he went. And somebody else said, you know, I saw him on a plane going to Ethiopia. You know, they had no idea. How crazy did it make Nixon that they couldn't catch him after, you know, a few days? Oh, Nixon, you know... It's hard to quantify that because he was already crazy in so many ways. Well, a good point. You know, this, is the, <laughs> this is the guy, and we had that scene in the book where, you know, after the Kent State massacre and these nasty protests are up, you know, he ends up stumbling out of the White House. It, I mean, he's doing this. He, did, he wasn't able to tweet at the time, but he was able to call people up and jabber at them and drinking heavily, um, as you alluded to. Um, but there was that night he stumbled out of the White House, I don't know, 2 or 3 a.m., and ended up going down to the Lincoln Memorial to talk to some of the protesters. And he brought his personal manservant with him, uh, who was a, a Cuban-American guy, Manolo, Manolo Sanchez. And, um, you know, when Nixon sort of roused these people out of their sleeping bags, uh, he was just glassy-eyed and not making sense and rambling. He was telling these protesters, you know, come to San Clemente and you can surf down there and visit me. And, um, and then he wandered over to the House of Representatives and uh, ordered them to open up the chamber. And, and then he ordered his manservant to go and make a speech, you know, to this empty house with Nixon and a couple of, you know, Secret Service agents there in attendance. And the, the man finally finished his speech and then he just heard this lonely sound of Nixon clapping it, you know, before dawn. So this is a guy who was already uh, was coming to the, the pressure of the presidency and was getting demonstrably more crazy. Um, his staff was worried about him. You know, he would drink and then call up and order, uh, you know, bombings of other countries in the middle of the night. And they would put him off until the morning when they knew that things would be better. So, so the, just the fact that. I like think he had so much pressure on him. The fact that he knew that Tim Murray was out there dancing away and mocking him at the counterculture. The entire counterculture was celebrating this as a great victory over Nixon. Um, just, it was just another thing that just ate at him and really caused him to sink deeper into that madness and paranoia that led to the Watergate break-in and all those other criminal activities that he engineered. Stephen Davis, the book is The Most Dangerous Man in America. Timothy Leary, Richard Nixon, and the hunt for the fugitive king of LSD. Stephen, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. It was good to visit with you, Jeff. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you.